Actually, she was at the American Jewish Historical Society in New York, mm -hmm. which is an awesome place. Mm -hmm. And you just, out of curiosity, said let me look at this? Or well, I was actually researching the topic that's turned out to be the topic of the book I'm writing now. Ah. And it was because I was looking for some sort of evidence to confirm these other rumors that I was interested in that I asked for the executive committee meeting minutes because I thought if there was any sort of uh, evidence that they had really discussed these other things, it would be in there. And so I was looking for something else, which I didn't find. And instead, I started reading about how much they spend for band instruments, and I read about they had a bit of a syphilis problem among the orphans because they were teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, and then I read about this group of eight children who were bald because of the x-ray treatments they'd gotten from a woman doctor at the Home for Hebrew Infants. And I just was so stunned. I didn't understand what, what was happening. Where were these x-rays? What were they x-raying these little infants In for? In fact, it was even more mundane to that because it was a request for a baby. That's mom. right. That's right. It was. It was. It was. <laughs> The motion, motion to purchase wigs for the children who are bald because of their x-ray treatments approved. To which your reaction was, what? What? <laughs> what does happen? Yeah, that was my reaction. What does happen? So then, because it, it went over about three different months, three different meetings, they discussed this. The kids had been brought in, and the first discussion is like, what happened to them and who's responsible? And so they wrote to the infant home. And then the next meeting, they said, we got a letter from the infant home where Dr. Elsie Fox, who's an expert in x-rays and a graduate of Cornell Medical College, explained her research in a letter, which they did not include in the minutes. So I don't know what it was ever really about. Um, and that the infant home agreed that they would take responsibility. And then the third meeting was, all right, we're going to buy them wigs and send them to foster homes. But take responsibility in the Financial. sense that they could buy them. I suppose words, it was a limited, yeah. oh yes, now we understand, we'll buy them later. Right, like who, who's going to get charged Those are for just these? a basic ethical question. Well, and I think too, in, you know, responsible for, if anything further occurred yeah. medically, what their needs might be. Right. But that's the last I saw it mentioned. Huh? So that's where it started. And uh, it was just so strange and interesting that I wanted to pursue it. And yet you wanted to pursue it. You teach at Shippensburg University. I do. So I you teach. could be classified as an academic. And you wanted to pursue I this. I paid enough for the PhD. I'm still paying my student loan, so. Well, but you wanted to pursue it in a <laughs> fictional way as opposed to yes. an article or a journal piece or something. Yeah, I was doing the research because I thought I would do a sort of narrative historical nonfiction um, centered around my family history and using that family history story to tie together these uh, various threads of American immigrant history. Um, but once which, I read which about quite a few writers have done within the past 10, 20 years. Yeah. So, so it's a really good structure for a story. I thought so, yeah. because in my family history we have, um, a, my great-grandfather was a, a contractor in the garment industry in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and um, exploited to some extent that resulted in a pregnancy, one of the girls that worked for him, and they lived in a tenement on the Lower East Side, and he ran off to Colorado because he got tuberculosis. I mean, it seemed like all these great mm -hmm. historical moments could be put together. But when I read about this business with x-rays and women doctors and bald kids, I was like, no, I want to imagine that, because I, I want to be able to write a story. Had you written short stories before? None that anyone else has ever read. <laughs> <laughs> so they haven't been published? No, they're un unpublishable, really. Okay. I mean, right. nothing I ever... I think I tried to get one story. Published. So how much wonderful combinations of ignorance and courage does it take? <laughs> oh, I'll just write a novel about this. Yeah, oh, I'll just write a novel about this. Um, I think a good combination of ignorance and courage. Um, which I think is a, a character trait of mine, <laughs> really. Um, I, my dad, at the first of my failed marriages, receptions, um, my dad told this story that he thought really exemplified my personality about how when I was, I guess it was summer camp, 
and I was taking my swimming test to swim in the deep end of summer camp Green Lake in the, in the Catskills, except I couldn't swim. So I, I don't know why I was doing this, and I really could not swim, and the whole time I was swimming, the lifeguard was like hovering with that hook over me, <laughs> right? Because they could tell I couldn't swim. But somehow I managed to like flail my way to the end, I think more because I was too embarrassed to get hauled out of the water. And my dad, said that's because she's so full of perseverance and courage and I thought I was just too stupid to like stop because I didn't know what I was doing so some combination of those two traits I think you'd need to write a novel. Yeah, what a perfect metaphor for fiction writing actually. I, apparently it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 especially, yeah, and especially the part where if you think at the end of that doc somebody's going to publish it which is really insane so. Right. I just did it to see if I could stick with it and get it done. Which you did. I did. And then you thought to yourself, now what? Now what? So you I mean, got, you know, the writer's market and okay. I wrote the beautiful query letters and I would like research agents and get books that they had represented and read those books so I could refer to them in my beautiful query letters that I put into nice little envelopes and sent to addresses that I think lead directly to paper shredders. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because nothing ever happened. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple places uh, actually rejected it, which was helpful because at least then you could cross them off the list. Yeah. You know, some intern actually read it. Um, but then there was that twilight zone where you don't know what happened to your life. The twilight zone where you don't know. It just disappears. But, you know, you, you can't take it personally. Um, agents get hundreds of emails a day sometimes. I mean, it's insane. So. In, even in the publication world, and this doesn't begin to cover the submission world or the consideration mm -hmm. world, there's over 25,000 books published per month oh, okay. now wow. in the U.S. That's a lot. Yeah. yeah. So that's, and a lot of that has nothing to do with brilliant works of fiction mm -hmm. or, you know, life-changing, you know, books of advice. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that gives the odds, uh, which I sometimes have to explain to starry-eyed writers who mm. come into the store and say, I have a great book for you, I get it published. Mm. And I try to encourage them, but it's, you also have a little, little dose of reality there, too. It's very unlikely that something gets published. And, um, and I didn't think my novel was commercial anyway. I thought it was sort of maybe a fiction imprint of an academic press or a small press. Um, I submitted it to Bellevue Literary Press, which is a branch of, somebody gave a big grant to Bellevue Hospital to do something in the humanities, so they started a press, and they said no. And I sent it to Feminist Press of City University of New York, so that, that's really where I thought it might fit. And then when I met the editor from William Morrow, I was very surprised. Was this like a social occasion or professional occasion? Yeah, it was, I went to a conference called the New York Pitch Conference in New York, um, and there again, I went because at my university, you only get funding for travel on the semester. You're not on sabbatical. I had a sabbatical coming up. And I knew I couldn't travel at all during that semester. Um, so I thought, well, I'll use my conference money. Where do I, I like to go to New York so I can do some research what's happening in New York. So I'm like Googling conferences and New York writing conferences. And this thing came up, this New York pitch conference. Um, and it was all about how to pitch your book, how you, you would learn how to sum up your book. You know, so I was at 90,000 words at that point, and you have to get it down to 300. Right. And yeah, it's the elevator pitch. The elevator pitch. Right. And it's so daunting. So anyway, um, and I thought, well, I have this book I finished last year. It's sitting around in a drawer. I'll just send them that. Send them a sample of that. Hi, come on in. And... Um, so I went to that conference, and as part of the conference, editors come, and you can like practice your pitch on them. And, and so that's when I met Tessa Woodward from William Morrow. I practiced my pitch on her, and she said, wow, I want to read that tomorrow. Which is sort of like lightning striking. <laughs> yes. Well, and it's the only time she's ever gone to that conference. She's never gone to that conference if, again. Imagine um, the dread that editors have when they say, by their, told by their companies, no, you're assigned to go to this conference. <laughs> <laughs> and think, yet, here yeah. she is, and she's thinking, oh my goodness. 
And they, yeah, and you know, sometimes they hear things they're interested in. Um, but, you know, because I had it written, I mean, it wasn't what you've read. It was a, a the rewrite is much better than, than the novel she bought, but I had it finished, right. um, as finished as I could make it. So I sent it to her the next day, and then uh, they bought it two weeks later, which is also insane. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, and then and did we I rewrote you it. Did we hear any screams, or did you know? Was that to... Oh no! When did you first tell me that you had written a novel? My mom you? told you. Oh, that's right. My, I, like when my parents moved to Carla when they retired, and I'm like. You can't talk about me all over town. This is a small town, right? No, I know people. I know people. You can't be just like going on. Like, oh, my daughter, blah blah blah. Um, so no, I came in the store and you said, "I hear we're going to be selling your book soon." I'm like, "Oh, my mom must have been in here." <laughs> was that about a year before it was actually That would have been like October, November, 2013. That was the fall. Mm -hmm. Right. And it and it came out. I do remember that 15. she came in and said, "My daughter's written a book," <laughs> and I thought I rolled my eyes. <laughs> yeah, yeah so hasn't everybody thought I'm that? I'm sure she has. Yeah, that's right. And then she explained to me the reality because your mother's very persuasive and forceful and charming. <laughs> and, um, all of which traits, of course. Yeah. Uh, and then um, <laughs> I became extremely interested when she said it was hard to tell. Because HarperCollins is one of, not only one of the major publishers in the States, but I, a large part of my great fiction downstairs, including Harper Lee and a bunch of other people, are HarperCollins. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think she probably mentioned it to you, and that's when you had to come in and confess that you actually had. No, I, I just walked in because I come to the bookstore all the time. That's true. And you were like, oh, you wrote a book. So I was aggressive and picked it, picked it out. Okay. <laughs> That's how I remember it. It could that, that might not be the truth of things, but it doesn't say, uh, sound like you had a long period of you know awful revisions. It sounds like you. I settled in no, because I had a meeting with Tessa <coughs> in November, two thousand thirteen, and she's a fantastic editor for me. Like everything she says to me makes sense, and she gave me one steno pad, one side, tiny little writing of notes. Huh. And that took me until May of two, the next year. 2014. Yes. Yeah. Because um, it was a really significant rewrite, and I had to do some more research. I still didn't understand how X rays worked, so I just sort of, you know, I had, there was a, my yeah, orphan, she's before. like, the, 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 the little Rachel disappears into this infant home, and like, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. A year later, she comes out and she has no hair. And I'm like, I don't know what happened. I know. So I had to learn more about that. And that, that turned out to be a couple of the, the best chapters in the book, I think. And, um, you know, she's like, we spend too much time here. We don't spend enough time here. And I restructured it and expanded sections. Um, so it was a pretty significant rewrite. And, and I had a sabbatical that spring. Um, so I was really, I was able, I, I committed myself to a deadline that I thought if I can't take advantage of this sabbatical and get this done, then right. that's silly, so. Now, um, as all of you probably know, um, the classic tradition used to be in academia, when you take your sabbatical you, or you write a book, that's when you publish. And then it reduced itself over the years to you write an article and then you have it published and so forth. So what Kim actually did is going back to this classic model of you take some time off, you write a novel that becomes a national <laughs> that becomes a national bestseller. Yeah, right. Um, that hardly ever happens. Uh, Once again, this, you seem to have like happens. blessings sprinkled across your path here. I mean, for all the hard work. Yes. It's like a series of oh, this is what happens when you work this hard. This is what happens when you work this hard. Well, if you don't work that hard, nothing can happen. But it's not necessarily what does happen. Um, if you don't spend four years at home by yourself writing your book, nothing can happen. But chances are nothing will happen anyway. Um, yeah, and my my brothers and I aren't used to like happy blessings being sprinkled upon <laughs> our family. So going back to this great grandfather who ran off and left his sons to be orphans. Um, 
I don't know if that's where it started or my dad when he was little lived through the Blitz Creek of Rotterdam in it. Right. You know, so the, our family histories are not littered with like rainbows from the right. Um Yes, so my brother and I were very suspicious. Like, what does this good fortune mean? Who's about to die? <laughs> like, what terrible thing is about to happen? And it took me a while to mm -hmm. feel not nauseous, you know, and sort of like, okay, maybe, maybe this will be nice. In the spring of this year, you and I were quite excited at throwing a party for you in June. Mm -hmm. And then you told me, no, it's not going to happen. But that actually was good news. It was good news, and it was funny, because I came here, we were planning the whole June launch, and we had like a list and a meeting, and it felt very like official and bookstore-ish. Um, and then when I left, I checked my messages on my phone, and one of them was, your publication date has been changed to August, because it got picked as a target book of the month. Which you could not tell anyone. I was supposed to, I was under orders. I didn't realize how strict it was because, again, I thought if I say anything, they'll like withdraw my contract and stop <laughs> publishing my book. And then and your brother's for, will be right. And my yeah. brother will be right. Um, so finally, I told my editor, I said, I told my mom. She's like, You can tell your mom. <laughs> She's like, Just don't like put it on the internet. So, no, I was very scared. I was like, I can't tell you, John. So, yeah, it. so even from your local independent book seller, you said, no, 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 no party, but I can tell you what. I can tell you what. <laughs> so I don't know what you thought that was about. Well, I, I had a feeling that your publisher had cooked something up. Mm -hmm. And I and I thought it was actually something as mundane as they're going to switch you to hardcover. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know, but, but I, neither did I understand why there would be a mystery about that. Mm -hmm. um, but the Target news was huge. Huge. The target news was huge, and it elevated the book to. Um, it may have changed the title. It changed the well. It changed the title back. So yeah. we started. This was my title, Orphan with the Number Sign Eight. After many stupid things, you know, right. Nurse Rachel at Night. Or I don't even know. Um, Which was a porn movie. Like <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now I'll never be able to not think about that. Um, <laughs> So, but, but then, it, was, it was spelled out when yes, you came to me the, and said, the, the, I don't know, above my editor, above her editor at, at HarperCollins, yeah. they thought if they spelled it out number eight, it would be more searchable or something. And, and I was sad, and my editor, who was on maternity leave, like, and not even answering emails, she called me and she said, it's okay. But then Target had seen an early version somehow, and they said, oh, we like that. And they were like, okay, <laughs> back to number eight. And then, and then um, Target said, her suitcase looks too new. So William Moore said, we'll throw it down the stairs and put dents in it. So that happened. And then her socks used to have lace on them. And there was, I saw the cover with the notes back and forth, and it was like, Delace the socks because I guess they look too <laughs> luxurious or something. No orphan would have lace. No orphan would have lace. And I guess the, the coat had first come back from the art department red, and my editor said make it blue. It's interesting that Target did not say a single word about content. <laughs> they were so cool with everything. They were actually they were more interested cool in everything. packaging. They, yeah, they're only, they thought their, their customers would like it. Um, and they've published, they, they've promoted some fantastic books. Um, um, oh, yes, a book whose title is now eluding me for a second. We'll come back to that. Correct you can again. imagine them when I go to Target and really <laughs> look at their book section. Except I went down to our local uh, Target to make sure that Kim's book was there. It kept getting sold out. Tell the Wolves I'm Home. Oh, uh, right, Carol. Right. Uh, yeah. Carol something. Like, um, Tell the Wolves I'm Home is a fantastic book um, where the it's a, sort of a young girl and her uncle is gay and dying of AIDS and they published that and it didn't like it's not that they publish they promote they promoted it and they I the, the, Dara Horn you can buy her books at Target so I've often been at Target and yeah. looked at the books and said wow this is a really nice selection of all books that, and all these decisions are made on the national level of course they have a panel of readers who yeah. read advanced copies of things right. so yeah when target picked it they wanted us to hold off on the the release date so that it would come out in august because it was going to be the august book of the month pick of the month for august right.
Yes, and then and then all of a sudden it was getting marketed. And then you and could finally tell me it's sometime in early summer. I don't know when I was allowed to tell Right, you. and then we rearranged the date for the national launch day, which we had here. Yes, on the Tuesday. Why do books come out on Tuesdays? I have no idea. <laughs> I have asked publishers this, yeah. um, and they tell me they have no idea either. It's just the somewhere, way it somewhere happens. Somewhere started this. It's just how it's done. Right. I think they need to get the books out early enough in the week so if there's any concurrent book reviews, mm -hmm. as if book reviews matter anymore, um, which are always most influential mm -hmm. on the weekend, mm -hmm. that it'll be just ahead and it'll be available. And th and that's a completely speculative idea. So. Sounds like a good idea. We had 150 as as people downstairs. For it her. was crazy. Yeah. It was really hot. It was really hot. We I had, was a little afraid. We had all our air conditioning on. Faint. We finally had to open the back door for fresh air. We yes. had half the people there who could not hear a word, and yet they were as happy as the people <laughs> in the other room who could hear a word. And apparently there were snacks. I couldn't even see the snacks. No, the snacks, <laughs> no. Yeah, the snacks were, we yeah. had a lot of great snacks. It was a blur. Lots of wine. And I guess that's where the people in the front room who couldn't hear you were happy because they had all the wine <laughs> yeah. in the front room. Um, and at that point, you started to travel. I traveled a little bit, yeah. I traveled um, in August. I went to Los Angeles and did a reading at uh, Book Soup. And then I traveled to Phoenix and did a reading at Changing Hands. Um, so those were nice events. And then I've been traveling through various... I went to Pacific University in Oregon as a visiting writer as part of their writing writer series, and then I went to uh, Denver uh, through Jewish Book Council, um, and even before the book came out, I had gone to New York to attend a book expo, and right. I saw you there in your role as a buyer there. of books, and I, I was, was a, at a table as a writer third, of books. Yeah, third person in line, because <laughs> everybody was running around with what's called ARCs, advanced reading copies of this, and um, actually by then they had real copies, I think. No, they, no couldn't they were still. They couldn't know because this was May. Yeah, it was only May. So advanced reading copies, mm -hmm. and everybody was running around like this, and I had to fight myself to not grab everybody and say, <laughs> you know, she's here, and she's from Carlisle, and she teaches the show to her. She's mine. And, I know. Uh, I'm just going to get anyway, my books to You had, she filled up instantly this long line. Well, they give the books away. 50, 60 people. And, it was, and it's pretty. So, you know, somebody um, stands at the bottom of the line holding up the book. It's like, if you stand on this line, you can get this for free. So Book Expo is, I had never been. I just wanted to go to see what it was like. And you told me only rubes pay to go to Book Expo. And then I should <laughs> ask my publisher. So I asked the publisher, can I just come to Book Expo? And they're like, yeah, all right, we'll, course, we'll yeah. get you to sign books for half an hour. And then the Target thing happened, and then they got very excited about it. So, But there is... I mean, among the, among, there's probably several hundred signings mm -hmm. at this largest English language book convention in the world. Um, but remember, it's several hundred signings of an industry that has 25,000 new books a month. Mm -hmm. So um, it is selective. Uh, it's not just everybody and their third cousin out there mm -hmm. signing books. And it was tremendously exciting to wait until and it was on the third day. Yeah, it was that last day because you said you usually leave right. sooner and you like right. delayed your train so you could get. I your mean, she is not Stephen yet. King. She doesn't quite have the first day cred <laughs> yet, but uh, at the same time. No, they have this sort of table set up with these like cattle shoots, and you just get online and get, get a free book. And, right. Um, and you got to meet other neat authors. That that's been one of the most sort of unexpected and fun things about it is that I get to meet other authors at Jewish Book Council where you have two minutes to sum up your book to representatives of um, Jewish community centers and reading groups from around the country. Uh, there were 50 people in my group, two minutes each. And I was second to last. Somebody, had, her last name started with Z. So I wasn't Simon Powell last. was not there, Simon. but it was like that. It was kind of like, yes, then they hold up signs like Same, perfectly in. now. Yes. Yes. And that's so, but but in my group, so we're sitting alphabetically. So I got to I got to meet um, B. H. Shapiro, who has a new book out called *The Muralist*, and I got to meet Sadal Samuel, who has a book out um, called *The Mystics of Mile End*. And um, you know, I I met all these cool writers who were sitting next to me, and that was really neat. And at Book Expo, I got to meet writers, and at some of these events, I'm meeting people, and 
and it gave me the courage to put a panel together for a conference in April. Where I just wrote to these writers who I really admire said, hello, would you like to be on a panel with me about this? And they were like, okay. So it, it's, it's giving me a lot of courage. Um, I want to just switch you a few questions about the book. Okay. Um, How are you, you guys doing? We're doing like an interview conversation. Apparently. Yeah, this is like that. <laughs> and, then, and then you can ask us This is questions. like an actor's studio. Yeah, and I'm the annoying guy. Don't ask me those creepy questions. Right. No. James Lipton. <laughs> James Lipton, thank you. Um, What's your favorite curse word? You gave me a <laughs> um, advanced reading copy uh -huh. back when it was number. Yes. Eight. And um, unlike all of your family and like all of your friends, I did not read it in 12 hours. I did not read it overnight. You didn't read it overnight. And I've never told you why. I just always explained, oh, I've got so many books to read. I'm just a slow reader. I want to give it the proper time. I gave you all these wonderful, Yes. Invasive Was there, is answers. there a better story than that? Well, there's a slightly different story. All right. Let's have all of you read the book? You don't have? OK. Nice. I won't give anything away. <laughs> It's about an orphan. <laughs> well, that's the key. Okay. The orphaning happens in the first chapter in an act of incredible, brutal domestic violence, which I found extremely alienating. Oh, no. I mean, yeah. but it showed you I was already buying into the reality of your fictional okay. world that I took it seriously. Okay. And... I thought, if the rest of the book is going to be like this, I am not. I am going to have a very difficult time uh, because it's there's children involved. I felt like I was watching a Steven Spielberg movie because small children were in danger. There was incredible violence, and I thought, oh no, it's such a sweet, gentle soul who handed me this book. That's because you don't really know. <laughs> And that's what I struggled with getting over oh, that. Sorry. But about 50 pages into it, I clicked into the fact that I would actually be in the company of Rachel, Rachel Rabinowitz, who's the orphan of the title. Um, and Rachel is incredibly good company. The grown up one who talks to you? Yes. Yeah. And sweet and interesting and strong and complicated and a little gnarly and slightly eccentric and for many, many great reasons that are perfectly understandable. And then all of a sudden I was rushing. I, I felt like you had just you started off on a slow river and then you began to hit very interesting rapids and then things just take you away. And I rushed to this absolutely perfect ending, which was astonishing. And was after that, any time that Kim came in, after her about 12th time of asking me if I had finished the book, <laughs> I was able to verbal to her. I was sort of incoherent as to how wonderful the book was. You said nice things. I did say nice things. Yeah. Sincere things. Um, the thing is, though, you've got a lot of different forms of violence in this book. I guess so. Tell me of all the different ways that you <laughs> detect violence in your book. Um, I'll tell you about all the ways I detect violence in my book. Um, I think a lot of bad shit happens to people, as we're especially reminded of this morning. Yes. And these are moments that you have to really figure out how are you going to integrate that into the narrative of your life. Mm -hmm. um, and can you still take control of the narrative of your life, even if it incorporates incidents over which you had no control? So that's an interesting thing to me. Um, I, I feel like comparatively to some stuff I've read or things you see on TV, it's really- A lot really, of things you could find downstairs. Yeah, yeah it's really have. not that bad, I don't think. But you have human violence, you have mm. domestic violence. True. You have um, people lying to each other. I guess. So. You have people who are utterly uncaring of the violence they're doing to others. I think they don't see it that way. 
Right. You know? And yet violence is done because yeah. kids go bald. Kids go bald. Cancers and, develop. Yes. Yeah. And in, in doing medical research on other people, um, that, that was very interesting. I, another reason to do fiction instead of an article or a book, because in fiction, you get to imagine with empathy, what is the mindset of a doctor who says, oh, I've got a bunch of children here at this orphanage and no one to ask permission. Um, I wonder if there's some other way to cure scurvy. I think I'll give them scurvy and then try stuff out on them and weigh them and measure them and, and take samples of their stomach acid and make charts and graphs and write articles about it. And, um, and how is that bad? Could this be connected to the fact that the experimental doctor had no children herself? Um, well, the, the doctor that I kind of modeled her on was more uh, Dr. Hess, who was a real doctor who worked at the Hebrew Infant Asylum. Right. And he did a book called Scurvy, Past and Present, and he did a lot of research on children. Um, and so Mildred Solomon, no, Dr. Hess had children at home. But Mildred does not. Mildred does not, but okay. I don't know. I don't know you that... You know someone's going to analyze that in some future article or work on number. I don't know. I mean, to me, that was a, more of just a professional choice, you know, that yeah. she wanted to pursue her career, and that was more important to her than, than getting married and having a family, which would have distracted her from her career, so... Do you think that she ever saw the orphans as human beings, or did she see them as test subjects? I think... You see them as human beings, and you convince yourself they're test subjects. That's what I think. I don't think Mildred Solomon is as bad as people read her. <laughs> but I, but I, had, I had to make her it. up. So yeah. And then people ask me, why did you make this doctor a woman? I was like, well, that's what inspired me, was that there was a woman who was you know, in charge of an x-ray room, which was expensive right. and fancy in 1918. Um, so that was really interesting to me. You, s you understand, though, how people will ask you that question and then hear your answer and think, oh, she's just deflecting the gender nature of my question. She's just saying, oh, mm -hmm. when you refer to history, mm -hmm. it's an escape valve. You can Is escape it? from a question sometimes by saying, well, that's how it really was. I'm not making anything up. Well, but it, it, if somebody said, why did you make that doctor a man? Like, nobody would bother right. to ask me that. So I think it's an interesting question right. that that it was somehow this big decision on my part. I'm going to turn her into a female. Like, in a sense, it's a question you can't answer because you could just say, well, there's precedent. Yeah. And that's and I think that connection was much more dramatic and interesting. Oh, very much. In the, in the Be, novel, it's tremendous. Yeah. Yeah, because the, it, what happens is um, Rachel's working as a nurse when she's an adult. And this Dr. Mildred Solomon, who experimented on her, becomes her patient. Which is this one of, well, is the central... I'll never come up with anything this high concept Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's it's, really sad. It's the central <laughs> dramatic tension in the book. It is. That and it's so it. easy to sum up. Right. The, that's, this, that's part of your elevator pitch. This right. is why the thing I'm writing now is driving me crazy, because it doesn't do that. I don't think mo most things do. But remember, please, for mm -hmm. your own sake, that you didn't come up with your elevator pitch until well after you had finished the first draft of your novel. That's true. I didn't even realize Mildred Solomon was the antagonist for like a couple of years. Yeah, and it's a question of whether she sort of is or not. I think in, she in became, sense. once I became. realized she was, then she became it more. Yeah. I thought Amelia was the big antagonist, who's another girl at the orphanage. Yeah, that's right. She's sort of set up, but then doesn't. I mean, she diminishes with what Yeah, she's just another kid. Yeah, yeah. But yes, Dr. Solomon becomes bigger and bigger. But yes, then that's, that's such a cool situation. Right. Um, because we get to a point where Rachel has sort of figured out what Dr. Solomon did to her with these medical experiments. And there's Dr. Solomon, who's like in her care and under her control. Right. And, and so the two of them. And they end up like sleeping together in like literally, because um, it's a night shift and Rachel's tired and Mildred Solomon is like on morphine, so she's asleep and Rachel just sort of falls asleep and um, so like this incredibly intimate 
space. I like putting people in little spaces. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. Um, it, it is. But it, it just yeah. it, it just intensifies the, the dramatic conflict. It is one of the great scenes, actually, because you're continue, the reader is continually expecting a retribution, violence by Rachel. And actually, it's directly threatened, in a sense. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Kim has this ability to take your expectation and make it tighter and tighter and tighter until you're flipping the pages faster than you had any thought that you could read uh, because you're That's waiting for that retribution. And yet, mm -hmm. the retribution has these moments of incredible, strange tenderness. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you you begin to get very wonderfully confused and intoxicated as a reader. Um, well, it's because they're human. I, I was going to say it's because they're human people, but they're not. They're apparently <laughs> <laughs> um, they're made of people. Um, but yeah, they're, but they're I, dramatic that, truths. And that really interested me. And that was something I was I didn't know if I could pull it off, but I was always trying to get to that point where Rachel would like. How can you get a pretty basic? regular person to the point where they could consider harming somebody else? And then how can you reel them back from that? And how can Convincingly, you... Convincingly, persuasively. Persuasively. Um, one, one person wrote to me who read the book and, and said, that paragraph, that was my favorite paragraph. I was like, oh, I worked really hard on that paragraph. <laughs> I worked really hard on it. Um, and. Uh, Oh, and somebody else wrote and said, oh, that sentence about folding sheets was my favorite sentence. I was like, oh, I know which sentence you mean. <laughs> um, but most people don't notice that. But yes, I, I was really trying to get to that moment and make those things happen, and it took a few drafts to get there. And just to not let you off this implied or real violence hook, um, there's even also contemplated sexual violence in the Church of Co in Colorado. Um, Oh, yeah, well, there's that boy in the orphanage. Right. And With the uncle. And the uncle. That's based on my, my great-grandma. Her dad married his daughter to his brother and to so keep the where, money in the family. That's where that came from. And, and, and I don't imagine it was sort of the first little interbreeding moment in my family line because so, so my great-grandmother is colorblind, which is very unusual for women. This is a recessive trait. And it's usually, when you look this up, it's like a, a, an indication of inbreeding. So we come from some <laughs> little village in Russia where there were maybe like 10 Jews. And, and maybe they were all cousins. And, and by the time we got to the United States, so, so I don't know. I'm not colorful. So you, so you were settling it's some scores here, in other words. I, where would these weird ideas come from? Um, but yeah, so in a way, having those stories in my family history gave me permission. Because otherwise it would have seemed like very sort of silent movie melodramatic. But I was like, yeah, I think I can do it. I want, on behalf of all readers, not only the um, apparently tens and tens of thousands who have read your book, I want to thank you for being clever enough, smart enough, and true enough not to include a court scene in your book. A courtroom scene? Yeah. Oh. Do you realize that there's a lot of very shallow Hollywood executive producers who read your book and think, well, where's the court scene? When does it add up that people yell at each other in court? Oh. And you didn't do it. You avoided it. Because, see, I can read a book and say, yeah. she didn't do this. She oh, didn't. And you okay. keep thinking, well, of course I had to do this, and of course I mm. had to do this. Courtroom scene, huh? You did not take it to a case of public adjudication. No. All of your adjudication in this is private. It's personal. Personal. It's personal. Intense. Yes. Intimate. Yeah, that's yeah. more interesting, don't you think? You didn't see that as a choice ever, though. No, it never occurred to me that we could go to court. For any reason. So when the Hollywood producer comes to you and says, no, 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 we've got to change this to where okay. Kate Blanchett screams <laughs> at so-and-so, and you could say, yes, I'm fine with Kate Blanchett, but no, you can't have a court scene, and I yeah. want you to bring me along with you to say, right. are you guys idiots? You can't I can't <laughs> imagine how you could shoehorn a court scene into this book. But this would be a case where Rachel 
brings in Dr. Solomon and tries her or whatever. But that would be completely dishonest to the intimacy yes. that is in the very first chapter. Because some people who read it say, has anybody ever been sued? And I'm like, no, you don't really understand Right, how these you sort of look work. at them blankly, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm just saying, yeah. you pulled off something that oh, every, good. an obvious writer, <laughs> a, a canned, you know, mm -hmm. pull it out of the script book writer would have put in and you avoided that. I, I'm, I'm thinking of the things I'm working on and I don't think there's any courtrooms <laughs> um, anywhere. So I, I may keep avoiding them and make you happy. <laughs> the other thing that I need everybody should know, especially Mulan who has come up to investigate this. Mm -hmm. um, I know how fond you are of animals, and I know how you rely on them. I do. And uh, I was teasing you that there are no animals in this book. There's some mice. <laughs> <laughs> There's some mice, but they're, they're in a cage in a lab somewhere. Um, no, it was a strange oversight. I don't know why, you know, People couldn't have had like a pet dog or a pet cat somewhere along the line. Mm -hmm. And I almost didn't realize it until it was all done. I was like, nobody has pets in this book? I don't understand. Um, so the book I'm writing now has lots of animals. I was telling you, we have St. Bernard's and Boston Terriers and uh, parrots and monkeys and horses. You've overcompensated. I'm overcompensated. <laughs> so if you like animals, read my next book. And how does one, after this unexpected and mm. astonishing success of this book, um, how do you get yourself up to it? It's, it's actually kind of hard. Because um, while this was languishing in my drawer, nobody was interested in it, and I started something else. And I'm like 100,000 words into something else. They're not all good words, but there's a lot of words. And... Um, I thought that would be my, my next book. And when I was at Book Expo and I started to realize a lot of people might buy this and read it, then I thought I should probably make my next book more like this than the one I was working on. You were attacked by sequelitis. <laughs> it's not really sequelitis, no, I but I just thought, you know, if I read this book right. and I thought, I wonder what else this person wrote, I'd want there to be some connection. And so I went back to that topic I was originally trying to find out oh, when I discovered personal. the x-rays. So and I have something in a drawer that's about, it's sort of 1970s, New York, upstate New York, Manhattan, with side trips to Amsterdam and South America that I'm very fond of and we'll get back to. And instead I went, uh, sort of revived an idea that I had already sketched out. So the one I'm working on now is the same time period, mm -hmm. and in fact it's the same orphanage, fictionalized version of the same orphanage, um, but it's really different, and it's more about, I don't know, real estate. So we visit this orphanage, but it's in a very different way, and everybody's outside, and they move all around, so... The orphanage no longer exists. This or this, the orphanage that inspired this book does not exist anymore, it's a playground. Except you're making it very real for lots and lots of people. Yeah, so the book I'm working on now, it's the orphanage is in it, but it's really different. But it's it I'm much more self conscious, it's harder to write now because I I I get worried about it and I get worried about um, like I feel like people might actually read it. When I wrote that, I had no expectation anyone would ever really read it. So so, so success has created certain expectations within yourself. I think any that you have to sort of beat down on a regular basis. I have to try to not think about it. Um yes, I have to try not to think about it. So it's nice when you sort of get in a zone with the writing and you sort of forget anybody else will ever read it. That's helpful. Right. So and so no one else may ever read the next one. And what are you gonna do? Like I didn't expect anyone to read this one either. So, the chances anyone will ever read anything are so slight that you just have to be Great say, call. if I'm lucky, I get to see you once a week when you stop by the store. And, and he, he has dog biscuits, so Charlie, when I take yeah. walks with Charlie, she, Charlie likes to come in the direction of the bookstore. Um, every other visit, I should say, Kim, no one's going to read your second book. 
That would be so helpful. <laughs> I would really appreciate it. That would be great. That would be great. No, I'm not going to. I'll just try not to pester you about where is your second book. That's what It's gay right away. <laughs> because this book, people pick it up, and it turns out the main character is lesbian, but it's like her girlfriend's away it's, for most of it. It's and actually extraordinarily subtle in the sense. It's just... It's not a factor. It's just... Because some people ask me, like, why did you make her lesbian? I was like, I don't know, people are. That's okay. <laughs> do, you read, you know, do, you read, do you pick up most books and say, you know, why did Gatsby like a girl? Like, well, yeah. So anyway, um, but... There were a few people who picked it up because you can't tell they didn't put like a rainbow warning sign on the cover, <laughs> so so people read it um, unexpectedly, and sort of the best result is I, I talked to someone last the other night in Harrisburg and she said a grown up well read educated person she said this is the first book I ever read with a gay protagonist and the how does that happen yeah, right. and I think just. You know, it, it used to be you had to find that shelf in the bookstore, and I think now it's a little more integrated. And that is exactly why I always have problems with people asking for specialty categories in mm. my store. Where are your LGBT titles? Where is your gay and lesbian fiction titles? And I don't want this label, you know, please shelve within the gay, lesbian, you know, because... Well, and I think that's sort of dissipated out now, except for maybe right. nonfiction. No, and I have always worried about it, <laughs> and I've actually discussed with African Americans this issue. I do not want to ghetto-wise, I don't want to put James Baldwin in a ghetto. Mm -hmm. Which ghetto would you like me to put him in? Black The writers, Venetian Jewish one. Writers? Yeah, it's exactly it's right. Yeah. Is, it, is, this, is this only for the Jewish Book Council? No. Is it yeah. only for the gay lesbian readers? No. Is it only for the... You know, people who have trouble with their families. No. Um, <laughs> um, it's a universal view. I hope so. And so that's been a really positive thing from it. So a few people get a bit scandalized, especially the ones who are not clued in. Because right. if you're kind of thinking about you, you start to pick up on it pretty soon. And if right. you're not, then all of a sudden you get a big surprise in a library restroom. <laughs> of, of all shady dives. You know, of all the shady dives. Yes. yes. Uh, and um, and so that's the point where people who like perhaps bought it at the Walmart in North Carolina unsuspectingly are like, what kind of book am I reading? Um, so the one I'm re the one I'm writing now, I'm like, let's just like, let's just have a guy pick up another guy, chapter one, and I'm like, okay. Which sooner or later, stick with this book or not? But you may have to have Teresa call you and say. Does this work? Does this work? Why did you put this in now? You know, that sort of thing. You may have to argue about a lot of these things down the road. So. Oh, I yeah, mean, I'm Tessa, saying, you mean. I mean, that's a form of creation. Yes. That's a form of publishing. Yeah. But the, the editor at William Moore was, like, super supportive the entire time. Nobody sure. ever questioned it. And, and um, Target was into it. And so it's been yeah, sort of a non-issue. Yeah. So a Although, benefit to being a very late bloomer. So if I had been, <laughs> like, a precocious writer in my 20s, then right. I think that might have but I waited a long time. It was. It is very sweet of Kim occasionally to send me on to links saying, "This reviewer on Amazon wrote, great book, except for that lesbian part." <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, you got it. Which is the opposite of Jeff's reaction, which is always like, "Can you bookmark those lesbian pages for me, please?" <laughs> so I don't have to read the whole book again. I I did I did make one teasing reference to her uh, when I said he was very that, she, that she had. <laughs> written probably the hottest uh, lesbian scene that I've read in many years. Um, not so we like need I, to see his book. Not like I go out and like, search. What is this up against? But it, it's, it's, and I, I said that to tease her because it's not something she even regarded as quote unquote hot. It's just, no, I knew it's, it was it's, hot. it's just extraordinarily lovely. Yes. Right. No, it's I like, knew it was hot. Yeah. Yeah. But, but there you go. You're welcome. You didn't feel offended <laughs> that, oh, Stop. Okay, you know, <laughs> identity no. politics. Don't do that. No, right. you can have fun with it. That's right. what they're for. Right. Yes. Which is not something I use when people come up to me and say, "Is this book any good?" I, <laughs> like, I don't make a reference. <laughs> to that. I, I just, There's a sexy part. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but it's those are to be sort of weirdly honest. Those are like really significant plot markers for right. me in this book. The little sexy moments because those are. 
when I'm thinking about my characters, these are moments where they're like most intensely in relation to one another in ways that are really significant to their choices in life and their sense of who they are and their character. So for me, those are really significant moments. And, and they, they actually move the plot as well because they motivate people and give them reasons to do the things they do. So those are really significant. And they're not um, put in there as ends unto themselves. Mm. They're put in there in, in a, this web of relationships. And mm -hmm. some of the relationships are very tense and have very conflicted feelings. And some of the relationships are, you, you can, the reader can take a breath. Mm. Say. There's nice people in the book. There is nice. There are nice people. It's nice. not all violence that, or sex. Sex and violence and rock and roll. There's no, there's no rock and roll. But it's not that kind. There's of a book. marching band. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't want to. I, I just am fascinated by this idea of knowing how sweet and, and tender-hearted uh, and what a good person That's Kim so is. Nice. I looked back on her novel and thought, my goodness, she can write about violence. And she can write about sex, and she can write about, you know, I'm thinking of all these interesting things that um, I don't see when you have Charlie Dragon. There were the horses store. in it. Yes. They died. Remotely, yeah. But not good. There were horses in it. Okay. Well, and I think just if you're a grown-up human person, you know about a lot more things. And, and yeah. I made something of an effort to get to a point where I'm a happy, nice person. So... <laughs> You've worked at it. I have, I have actually worked at that. So yes, the writing is fun because you get to be like, ooh, I remember when I was intent on revenge. <laughs> I can use that now instead of like trying to purge it from me in therapy. And channel it safely yeah. onto a page yeah, or yeah. into the kitchen knife so, drawer or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Do you, so you stumbled in here, some of you who we know and have read it, and some of you who we don't know. And questions. I don't know. <laughs> yes, questions, or would you like to just know what this book is more about? Are you catching on, or do you, would you like we to haven't, write? We haven't given away it? anything that would detract from the enjoyment of the book. Uh, I'm looking forward to rereading it, actually, oh. which I know, will, I know would surprise you, yes. since it took me so long to get started. But anyway, questions? Yeah. Questions for Kim at all? Come on, fellow professional. <laughs> We've talked about it a lot. Let me yeah. think of a question. So, Kim, you yeah. said that the final book, which of course isn't a surprise, is mm -hmm. very different than mm -hmm. what you sold. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the process mm -hmm. of adding, subtracting, and multiplying? Um, and did you actually consciously change the plot to make the the doctor more of the antagonist as the plot as you went through more and more revisions? Yeah. Well, I, I changed it to develop that character mm -hmm. and to develop that those scenes. Um, so the yes. Yeah, so once I realized that this was sort of the main conflict of the book. And once my editor said, we need more Dr. Solomon. So I learned more. I had to do some more research. I learned more about x-rays. I learned more about women doctors in the early 1900s um, and the medical profession in general. So I learned more stuff. And then I was able to go back and, and understand her character in a richer way so that they had more to do, they had more to talk about. And so I'm really glad about that. Um, that was part of the revision. And then part of it too, it, it was structural. Um, I, yeah, it used to be like, it started, it used to start like, I'm Rachel Rabinowitz, a nurse bent on revenge with a pocket full of morphine. <laughs> and tonight someone will die. And I thought that would be like so dramatic and tense. And, and then I realized that it doesn't give the reader anything to do. You're like, why am I going to spend a couple hundred pages with this person? So now it starts like, I'm Rachel, going to work. Oh, we have a new patient. Oh, she reminds me of someone. Oh, I think she was my doctor. What did my doctor do to me? What did my doctor do to me? Now I know what she did to me. Now I'm really mad at her. She should apologize. She won't apologize. What am I going to do about that? So it's like, 
you, you get to have this experience with the character. So that was a big thing I learned um, in in doing the rewrite. A question. Yeah. Um, you talk about the book you're writing now being much more out in the world, mm -hmm. and whereas Orphan Number Eight was a lot of it set inside mm -hmm. the orphanage or even inside a hospital. Mm -hmm. How did you deal with the like the confines of the place? Because it reads in a very interesting, engaging yeah. way. Um, the, the building itself maybe being a character, or how did you keep the, the story <laughs> yeah. energetic while you had it in a place? Well, I like <clears throat> the settings a lot, and and again, I, I get really inspired by the research I do. It really helps me feel like I'm picturing a place that feels real in my imagination. So for this orphanage that's based on the Hebrew Orphan Asylum, I mean, I have at home a Xerox copy of the architect's handwritten prospectus for the building from 1880, where he describes like the fire escapes and the stairways and how many bathrooms it has and, and how it's all laid out. And then I've read a lot about how they lived in it and sort of would move through that space. So it gets to a point where it just seems like I can just go to it in my head. And then my characters just, you don't have to really explain it to the reader we're just moving through a space and I think then the reader just follows along because the characters seem to know where they're going um, but I liked all those places and and so now that I have characters moving around out in the world I'm taking out these subway maps from 1910 <laughs> all the time because I'm like what stop would he get off on the third avenue elevated train and when did they build the elevated train and so for me I really need a sense of reality and maybe especially because it's historical, um, and I can't just look out the window and know how would you get to New York, um, and I have to look it up. And and then once I get to a point where I feel pretty confident, then the character can just move through that space. I don't have to explain that space, and and that's helpful for me. So yes, now my characters are like all around New York. <laughs> You know, you know you're reading a bad historical novel when you get the writer continually explaining, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. they're saying, I did all this research and you're going to live through it whether you like it <laughs> right, or not. Right. Whereas Kim does her research so her characters can live in this space. Mm -hmm. And then it's so much easier. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so much a better way to deliver the goods. So. Yeah. It, I like it. Yeah. I had a couple of paragraphs I lost out of the first chapter. That I really resisted. My editor kept saying, "So there's like a whole page of backstory on a character who's going to die in five pages." <laughs> um, it's very confusing. The reader thinks, "Whose book am I reading? Am I going to read about this person?" And I said, oh, "I read a 400-page book to write those two paragraphs." And, <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, uh, Irving Howe, um, the what's it called, the World of Our Fathers. Yeah, World of Our Fathers. The World of Our Fathers about the whole Lower East Side and the garment industry and um, with a touch of sort of tree grows in Brooklyn, you know, all this. And my editor was like, no. No, don't do it. So then I cut them out. But I cut out three paragraphs. So she said, oh, no, put the pickles back in. <laughs> like, I like the pickles. So the pickles went back and the garment workers came out. Um, Thank you, Colleen, for Bye. stopping by. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye. Colleen has the book already. Um, so, yes, thank you. I do a lot of research. And I'm super bad with dates and chronology, which makes me always very uncertain. I have to have big charts on my wall because I, I have a very hard time. It's difficult for me to conceptualize time just in my own life. Since my daughter graduated college, I have now no mark. I have no, if for a long time when you have a kid, you can be like, that was third grade. And, it, and you're like, I don't know what year third grade was, but I know it was third grade because it's so tactile. And now I have no idea how much time passes. So yeah, historical fiction is kind of a weird fit for me. It's but. good for you because I'd rather have you worried about what year the L was built <laughs> rather than what will my future readers think of this page? <laughs> oh, good. I'll use it to distract myself. <laughs> um, I'm going to probably run downstairs now, but feel free to talk to Kim. Yeah. If you'd like to purchase any copies, you can just grab them, have her inscribe them, bring them downstairs. One last, um, this has been an amazing week in the Whistle Stop's life. We had a uh, open mic night for Dickinson Review. We have Kim today. On Thursday of next week, 
we will be supporting a poetry reading by a very talented young writer named Ross Gay. He's going to be at um, the Allison Community Hall, the old Allison Methodist Church, uh, at 6.30 on Thursday. And on Friday, we're going to have a fellow Shippensburg professor. Yes, fantastic poet. Nicole Santa Lucia, um, or Santa Lucia? Santa Lucia is what I say. She has a, a book called Because I Did Not Die. She'll be here at the store in this room on Thursday night at... Is it Friday night? Sorry, Friday night. Yeah, yeah. So this is the this is the complication with chronology. <laughs> Thursday is Ross Gay. Friday is uh, Nicole here at the store. Um, I'm drawing a total blank. I think it's maybe it's the five to six period. I think so. Five to six mm -hmm. period, and then we can all go off to dinner. Um, and then Saturday, we also have. Um, a Carlisle product who went through Carlisle High School, taught at Carlisle High School, now lives in Mechanicsburg, um, because all the difference by Leah Ferguson, um, who has also had her debut novel published uh, by Berkeley, major publisher. Um, a lot of similarities to Kim's experience, um, actually, into having lightning strike twice within a few miles of each other. Mm. So she will be here next Saturday. So we have three author events next Saturday, back to back to back. And obviously you're all invited and welcome at all of them. Uh, it should be quite different experiences, actually, all three, mm -hmm. which will be fun. And then on December 3rd, um, we're getting the return of a very popular reader we had last fall, uh, Megan Reedy, who used to teach classics at Dickinson. And she writes this wonderful small booklet installment series about a character named Apple Elder Rose and her adventures in the world. And she prints the books herself with a local letterpress printer. And they're beautiful little productions. And she's a very dynamic, uh, charismatic reader. She'll be here on December 3rd. If you'd like. You know, I expect you all, of course, to remember all of that. <laughs> if um, both our website has all these events listed under the new events page, we do have a newsletter that we send out to people electronically, and our Facebook page. Is that uh, up to date, finally? Is, up, page. is all up to date. Very uh, good. <laughs> so check in, basically. Uh, the next six weeks are the busiest in the book industry. And we have lots of things going on, lots of great books. I expect this. There's to be a Hanukkah scene. <laughs> <laughs> There's a really nice Hanukkah scene. So if you're thinking like, hmm, what to get? Because you have to get eight things. That's true. So a paperback with a Hanukkah scene. This book will be continually selling for years to come. Um, it's been extraordinarily popular with reading groups. Reading groups. Yes. She's book been clubs. skyping all over the world for this book. And, yes. And um, you've got many translations actually. We just got Spanish. Okay. So that makes 11. 11 languages. Yeah, 11 languages. Um, so talk to Kim, stay in touch we with We don't her. have French or German yet, though. Come. I know. Well, they don't, you know, you have to warn them. They're going to be bobbing along in the line of the movie rights at some point. So. There's no movies. No. Uh, we hear nothing. To come. Um, oddly enough, one little final detail, which I get questions about. Um, there was a paperback original novel published three years before Kim's book called Orphan Train by a woman named Christina Klein. Baker. Um, yeah, and sold extraordinarily well. Um, and actually it was a word of mouth, huge bestseller. The publisher was finally persuaded to also bring out a commemorative hardcover version of it. And I gather the movie rights to that have sold years down the road. I think she's just started mentioning something about movie rights. Right, as I've heard rumors. Yeah. Um, this book has nothing to do with orphan training, <laughs> which I have to explain to so many people. But in a way, it does. So there's well, that's two what things. I tell people. There's right. two things. First of all, orphan training was William Morrow. So they were like, ooh, orphans. <laughs> we're on a theme here. <laughs> we like orphans. In fact, they said to me, we like orphans at William Morrow. And it is the same time period, so it's sort of same like, what do period. you do with kids if their parents can't take care of them? And one 
big institution, fund it really well, run it efficiently, um, and the others put them on trains and send them to farms. What could happen? Farms uh, are good. So, it, yeah, so or, they, they're, they're, they go for, together, yeah, but they're for, different yeah, books. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> different books. This is not a sequel, as I've had to explain to some people. Um, work and train, big wide open spaces, big wide open issues, sort of. Mm -hmm. Uh, orphan number eight, small, interesting, intimate spaces and intense, uh, super personal relationships. It's a little darker than orphan train. A little train. darker than orphan train, right. But that's reflecting the darkness that resides. The darkness the that I, I have so cleverly it's, learned to mask. That's right. That's right. So well <laughs> but thank you all very much thank for coming. You guys. Thanks to. Greg. I hope you like this interview chat format we right. tried today. So. It's an experiment. But that's mostly because whenever Kim comes in, we enjoy each other's company so much, we thought, oh, what the we'll heck? Just talk. We'll just make everybody else listen. There you go. Um, and Greg Bear is filming it for us, which he will edit into something that will go viral on YouTube. And um, he did not take any pictures of you, I believe, so you're all free from that. No, no release is necessary. But I gather Mulan is in the video. Mulan is in the video. She's very clever. She stole okay. her scene. Well, thank you all yes. so much for coming. Thank you all. Turn it off so you, don't, you won't wander in front of the frame anymore. <laughs>